If you're still on the patio and you can hear me, come inside the building now. Well, good morning to you all. We're not going to sing. No one's listening. No, that's true. Judy and Judy in the front row are listening. Yeah, it's the front row. If your name is Judy, you should be sitting in the front row right here. Judy Rindall, you should be right here. Well, good morning, everybody. Hi, Annie. Good morning. I would like to uh, begin our morning in a word of prayer. So would you bow with me this morning? Heavenly Father, good morning. We're grateful to know that you are here with us this morning. As we lift ourselves and our time to you as an offering, God, please be pleased with our offering, God. Be with Christina as she's away this morning. Um, preparing our study guide for the next semester. Um, God, give her your wisdom and reveal your heart to her of what you have for us for the next semester, God. Speak with us, speak to us today. Pour out your wisdom through Sherry, who will be teaching us. And be with our nation, Father, um, as this is the final week of the election season, God. May it be a peaceful week. May it be a week where our hearts are filled with the hope that only you can provide. We love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I haven't talked about my little dog, Elaine, in a while. So I have a little Elaine story that I wanted to share with you um, this morning. So just for per perspective, my husband, Scott, wakes up earlier than I do every single solitary morning. Um, he goes downstairs. He opens up the door to his den, which is where our dog Elaine sleeps. She runs out. She, he lets her out to go to the bathroom, and she runs back into the house. She runs straight upstairs and lays down outside of my door, facing my door that's closed, and sits there and waits. Uh, it is, I don't see it because I'm behind the door, but my son has taken pictures of it, and my husband laughs every morning. Well, she is not deterred. She waits outside that door. And sometimes it's a really long time. Sometimes Scott wakes up really early and I decide I didn't really sleep that well last night and I don't really have anything going in the morning so I'll stay asleep for a little longer than I normally would. But she is undeterred. She stays there and waits for me. She won't go back downstairs for any reason. And as soon as I open the door, she runs in jumps up on the bed, waits for me to get back under the covers, and leaps across my chest. Literally, she lays across me. So I'm laying down there, I got my covers on, she's laying across me, and she looks like a queen on a little throne. She sits there, she's got her head up, she's so happy, and every single solitary morning, this is her routine. She did it this morning. Um, it's the way she starts her day. It's a habit. She emotionally needs to connect with me that way in the morning. She feels close to me, and she can begin her day that way. Um, but what struck me was that I wish that my mind <laughs> was as single-mindedly focused on God every morning as she is on me. Um, I was thinking that there are some mornings that he is the first thing I think of when I wake up. But many mornings... <laughs> my to-do list is what's running through my head, or a person that I've been concerned about and worried about comes to the front of my mind, or just my day, just what, what, do I, what does it look like? Or a dream I had is the first thing that pops into my head. Um, and just as Lainey is waiting in the hall for me to wake up, God is waiting too. He's waiting to be led into my thoughts. He's waiting to begin his daily conversation with me. Um, and I was thinking, what if my first thought every morning was to jump into the lap of my father for his comfort, for a conversation with him, to feel his hands on me, to feel how much he loves me, for just to be as close to me as possible. And just as Elaine is in the habit of beginning her mornings with me, 
I want my desire to spend time in the arms of my father first thing every morning to become a habit for me too. Um, as she was laying on me this morning, I was scratching behind her ears and rubbing her back. I decided that what a good time for me to actually spend time with the Lord while she's lying on me. I'm sitting there. I can't do anything else. <laughs> let's, let's actually use this time to spend with Jesus. And I did this morning. And I thought, you know what? This is going to be, I want this to become a habit for me. Um, and so the visual of just seeing her leap across me, I hope becomes a visual for you too. You can picture, picture what that looks like. Um, and just a reminder of just that God wants us to leap into his arms in the morning. He wants us to start our mornings with him. He wants to give us that comfort. He wants to provide just that little scratch behind the ear to say, I love you. I care about you. Um, Anyway, so I just thought that, you know, it's just sort of a fun little picture, and I hope that that's encouraging to you guys this morning. Um, was there a clap? Did I hear that? <laughs> wow. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Weird, but okay. That's great. Um, so shifting gears a little bit. We're not going to have a spotlight this morning because um, our spotlight person had something come up and, and couldn't do it, and we couldn't fill in last minute. So we're going to start our morning a little bit on the earlier side, but we'll have an announcement at the end that maybe we'll make up a little time. But I also wanted to just share with you guys that if you didn't know, many of you probably already do, but our dear friend LaVon Biddle, um, who had been a part of our ministry here and part of this study for years and years, um, went home to be with the Lord on Thursday morning last week. Um, and if you knew LaVon, you knew her to be a fireball. Um, 96 years old, she drove until like the last year of her life. She, I just heard a story this morning that she would come out and before we had Julio here blowing off the patio for us in the mornings, she would sweep with Yvette Kratzberg when she was 86 years old. She swept off the patio so that it was a pretty welcoming place for you guys to walk into. She, for me, was the unofficial greeter of Grace Fellowship Church. She knew everybody's name. She stood out in front, and she greeted people by name as they walked into the room. And um, she will be really, really missed. Her little face, um, I will miss, and I know many of you will. But um, there will be a celebration of her life um, on November the 15th, right here in this room, probably at 1 p.m., and, and then just a little reception on the patio. So we would love to have all of you guys um, <clears throat> come and just celebrate her life with her family and her dear friends on that day. Um, so this, shifting gears again, here we go. Um, we have Sherry speaking with us today, speaking to us um, on the topic of thou shalt not murder. Um, and she was sharing this morning kind of a funny story that she seems to always get these really dramatic kind of things when she has to teach. She, she taught on not the mercy and the love and the, the grace of God, but the justice of God when we did that study. And she gets murder today. So <laughs> she's pretty excited. And, and there's people here. So people showed up, which is great. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, she was concerned. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Um, so let me, um, let, me, let me read our passages uh, for us this morning, and then <clears throat> we'll move into a song. Um, page 93. Um, Exodus 20, 13 says, you shall not murder. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 21 through 24 says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother or your sister, that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. Our song this morning is Great Are You, Lord, by One Common and Genevieve. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore. 
restore every heart that is broken. We sing great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only we sing great are you lord you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great Good morning. Good morning. Am, I, am I on? Okay, yeah. I was a little, just a tiny bit worried if anybody was going to give Bible study a pass. It might be this week. <laughs> I mean, even Christina's not here. She chose this week to work on the study guide. <laughs> just saying. So good for you all for being here. Okay, so we are now halfway through our study of the Ten Commandments that God gave his people to help us live the way that we were meant to. Over the past month, we looked first in depth at the first four commandments, which are about our relationship with God and important ways we can show our love for him. And then last week with Stephanie, we studied the fifth commandment, which is specifically about how we can honor our parents. And today, we'll be taking a closer look at the sixth commandment, which is 
the first of the last five, which are all about our relationships with all other people. So here's the sixth commandment that God gave his people. It's, this thing's on, but it's not. Let me turn. It wasn't on. Okay. It's the other on. Okay. So here's the sixth commandment that God gave his people. You shall not murder. This particular commandment seems really straightforward and obvious, right? In the sense that murder is seen and treated as a terrible crime almost everywhere in the world. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that most people, whether or not they're Christians, view a law against murder as, as being good and, and important. As followers of Jesus, we know that the commandment against murder isn't just for the greater social good of humanity. We know that God made man in his own image and that all human life is precious to him and that no life, including the unborn, is disposable. And so to intentionally take someone's life is to kill another person who was also created by God. And that obviously involves assuming the right to end a life that, it, that belongs only to God. Now, in looking at the Sixth Commandment, I think it's pretty easy to think, you know, I, I think I'm okay on this one. You know, at first glance, this doesn't seem to be one of those really convicting passages of Scripture where when you listen to it, you know that this teaching is hitting perilously close to home and you know in your heart that you have some work to do to bring your life as a follower of, of Jesus into alignment with God's kingdom. But... Then there's the other passage that we looked at for today from the Sermon on the Mount. In his teaching here, Jesus doesn't stop with just outward obedience to the letter of the law against murder. He goes much deeper to the underlying spirit of this commandment, which has much broader implications for our relationships with other people than simply not murdering them we'll see that the deepest intention of this commandment demands an all-encompassing internal change in our heart so that we can reflect God's heart for other people in the way we think about them as well as how we speak to them and act towards them. What Jesus is teaching his followers here is fundamentally about living in right relationship with the people around us. And ultimately, this means treating other people in a way that reflects their value as having been created by God in his image and that reflects God's love for them. What Jesus teaches in this passage is also straightforward, but on the surface, at least, it's not as easy to understand because of the huge distinctions that we draw between various types of behaviors. And that's why I think when we first read the verses in the Sermon on the Mount that we looked at for today, it might seem to us that the different consequences that Jesus talks about, they don't line up in the way that we would expect with the seriousness of the various actions he's talking about. So let's take a closer look at this passage to try to better understand what Jesus is really teaching us here about treating other people in a way that reflects God's heart for them. And as we do that, I think we may find that the underlying heart of the Sixth Commandment, it actually does hit perilously close to home. So here's the passage. Okay, I do have it on now. Okay. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, 
Go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. So in these verses, Jesus begins with what seems to be the worst, most extreme behavior, murder. But then he quickly weaves in teaching about anger and insulting comments that are, you know, certainly not nice, but that we don't typically think of as being as serious an offense as murder. Now, as we look closely at these verses, we should notice that the perceived seriousness of the actions that Jesus talks about decreases. So he goes from murder to anger to insulting comments. But the consequences that he says each of these leads to actually increases and becomes more severe. So let's unpack this passage one verse at a time. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. I mean, so far, so good, right? That seems reasonable. Then comes the next verse. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So here, Jesus seems to somehow be equating anger and murder. This is where it gets harder to understand because I think it's safe to say that we don't usually think of anger and murder as being the same level of seriousness. And then, in the second half of verse 22, Jesus goes on to say, there we go, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. As our study guide notes, Raka is an Aramaic word that means empty or stupid. So here we find Jesus teaching that insulting someone by calling them, you know, ignorant or stupid leads not to judgment, but to a more serious consequence, being answerable to the court. And then he ends this verse by saying, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell, which is clearly the most serious consequence that he talks about here. So how do we make sense of this teaching that calling someone else a fool can merit the fire of hell while murdering another person is simply subject to judgment? Well, the answer is that Jesus is going much deeper here than just outward obedience to the letter of the law in this case, the law against murder. If you think about what the act of murder flows from, it's, it's really the ultimate way of showing through actions that another person's life doesn't matter, that their life is of so little value that it can simply be snuffed out. What Jesus is teaching us here is that when we lash out in anger at someone or demean or insult them by the way we speak to them, that doing those things, that also reveals an underlying heart posture, an attitude of contempt, really, for another person's life. Another person who was also made in God's image and whom God also loves. And the consequences that Jesus lays out in the verses that we looked at for today tell us that we take this sort of contemptuous heart posture very seriously because it will lead to things like anger or insulting comments that God takes very seriously. Now, I'd be willing to bet that I am not the only person here who has said something in anger to someone else, and I could immediately see by the look on their face that I had crushed them. I had verbally slaughtered them. Now, that wasn't my intention. I just wanted to express my anger. But by doing that, I had inflicted a lot of hurt on another person who was made in God's image, a person that I'm called to love as a reflection of God's love for them. And I have to say, in the polarized world that we are all living in, particularly in the run-up to an election, I think it's really easy to slip into thinking about different groups of people, other people at first maybe with amazement and dismay, but over time that can morph into anger and that can easily devolve literally into an attitude of contempt toward them. And when we're thinking about other people with anger or contempt, the way we speak to or act towards those people will eventually, if not always, reflect what's going on in our hearts. While murder is obviously very serious, 
What Jesus is teaching us here is that when we speak to another person in anger or make insulting comments, those are also surface, surface manifestations of a much deeper brokenness, which is our heart posture. I mean, it's literally how much we do or don't value their very existence as a person. We need to deal with the brokenness in our own hearts in order to be able to consistently speak to other people, even those whose actions we don't agree with, to speak to them in a way that reflects their intrinsic value as having been created by God and loved by God. And this is where we find the application to our own lives. While it's certainly good to be intentional about not speaking to other people in anger or with insulting comments, instead of directing our attention only to the way we speak to other people, we really need to focus more on an inner transformation of our own hearts. That's critical because it's only that inner transformation that can actually lead to a sustainable outward change in the way that we speak to other people. If we never work on the brokenness in our own hearts, we're never going to be able to fully and permanently change how we think about or talk to other people. We can try really, really hard and maybe for a period of time see some changes, but an outward change in how we talk to other people, it's never going to last if we haven't been transformed on the inside, in the very core of our being. Here, Jesus is touching on an area of brokenness that probably affects us all. This is where his teaching probably does hit perilously close to home for many of us, where our lives as followers of Jesus aren't yet in total alignment with his kingdom. Our hearts still need to be transformed by his spirit so that we can love other people the way he loved us. Even if those other people are completely lost and not walking with God, they're still precious to him. Now, in the verse that's immediately before the passage that we looked at for today, Jesus tells his followers that unless their righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, they're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. And that statement actually informs what Jesus is teaching in the passage we looked at, which is about murder and anger and insults. And what we're learning from our passage can also help us understand what Jesus meant here about needing to have righteousness greater than the Pharisees. So the Jewish religious leaders of his day, they held themselves out to be truly righteous because they knew the law and they claimed to always follow it. As we know from what Jesus said about them here and elsewhere throughout the gospels, there were several ways that the Pharisees failed to live truly righteous lives. But the issue Jesus is highlighting here is that they only cared about outward compliance with the letter of the Mosaic law. The Pharisees weren't at all concerned with the sin and brokenness of people's hearts, even if that heart condition is what led to an inability to keep the law. As a result, the Pharisees missed the underlying and more expansive spirit of what the Sixth Commandment as well as the next four commandments are ultimately about, which is reflecting God's heart for all other people with our thoughts and our words, as well as our actions. Jesus cares a lot about the sin and brokenness in the hearts of his followers. And that's why he told the people listening to his Sermon on the Mount that their righteousness needed to exceed that of the Pharisees. Because Jesus clearly wants more than simply exterior compliance with the letter of the law. His teaching on the sixth commandment against murder is one example of the deeper heart transformation that he wants his followers to seek after so that we can live up to the broader underlying spirit of all God's commandments and by doing that reflect God's heart for everyone he created. Now, some of you might be thinking right about here, wait a minute, in, in these verses, Jesus seems to be talking about anger and insulting comments only towards brothers and sisters. So does that mean that his teaching here is just about how we speak to other Christians? 
Well, I asked Dave Gunlock for his take on this question, and he said that there are some verses later in the Sermon on the Mount, as well as elsewhere throughout Jesus' teaching, that lead him to believe that Jesus wants his followers to show love to everyone, whether they're believers or not. Here's one of the verses that Dave cited from later in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Another example of Jesus teaching about uh, living in a way that reflects God's love for all people is found in Mark's gospel, where he records that Jesus says the most important commandment is to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And your neighbor can be anyone. So even though the verses that we looked at for today deal with anger and insulting comments in the context of other believers, when you look at the overall arc of what Jesus taught, it's really clear that he wants his followers to show love to all other people. And our ability to do this requires a transformed heart. With the help of his spirit inside us, the, the deep heart transformation that we need, it can take place, and we can become more like Jesus, more and more able to love other people in our thoughts as well as our words and our actions. Here's how Dallas Willard wrote about this idea of what flows from our inner nature in his book about the Sermon on the Mount that's titled The Divine Conspiracy. It is the inner life of the soul we must aim to transform, and then good behavior will naturally and easily follow. Just as an apple tree naturally and easily produces apples because of its inner nature. Isn't that a great simile? What Jesus is really seeking in us is a fundamental change in our inner nature. That's what we, we mean when we talk about transforming our hearts. Jesus is pointing his followers to a heart transformation that can happen with the help of his spirit so that we can lead a kingdom life that's deeper and more expansive than just what the sixth commandment against murder states. It's a way of life that fulfills the deepest intention of this commandment, which is to reflect God's heart by loving other people through our thoughts and our words as well as our actions. Now, we're all still in the process of being transformed to become like Jesus, and because we're all still broken, sinful people, we don't always treat other people the way we should. We get angry, or we say unkind things. That's what verses 23 and 24 in today's passage are addressing. This is where Jesus talks about seeking reconciliation with someone that we've offended with our anger or our insulting comments before we come to God with an offering. Here are these verses. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. So in biblical times, presenting an offering to God was a way of expressing devotion or thanksgiving or asking for forgiveness. This was how God's people in Old Testament times could approach him. Our relationship with God has been fully restored, and so we're now free to come to God directly, anywhere and at any time, and to offer our worship to him or, or offer him thanksgiving or ask for forgiveness. And today, we might do this during a private, quiet time in the morning, or maybe at a Sunday service where we come to God in community with our church family. In these verses, Jesus is teaching his followers to first seek reconcili reconciliation with someone that we've offended with our anger or insulting comments, to try to repair that relationship before we come to God to experience the blessings of our relationship with him. And the reason this is so important is because our relationships with other people are actually an important aspect of our relationship with God. Our faith isn't just about having our sins forgiven so we can enjoy eternal life with God. As people who follow Jesus, our faith is also very much about becoming more like him 
in terms of how we live our lives now, loving God and loving others. As followers of Jesus, we're meant to live like he did, in a way that reflects God's character and his love for everyone. And that's one reason why our relationships with other people matter a lot to God. The other reason is that treating other people whom God loves respectfully and in a loving way, that's actually an important way we can show our love for God himself. In one of his Sunday sermons a few years ago, Dave Gunlock told a story about his kids that really exemplifies this idea. He talked that morning about watching one of his three daughters be really mean to one of her sisters. And then right after that, she ran over to him and hopped on his lap and told him how much she loved him. And Dave said that his response as a loving father to all of his children was to remind the one daughter who had been really mean that he loves her sister just as much as he loves her. And that it was important to him that she go and make things right in her relationship with her sister before she came and sat on his lap and told him how much she loved him. Dave wanted his daughter to actually show her love for him through the way she treated her sister. And our Father in heaven feels the same way. God wants us to love him more than anything else. That's what the first four commandments are about, specific ways we can show our love for God. But God also wants us to love other people because he created them too, and he loves them too. That's what the next six commandments are all about, specific ways we can show our love for other people. God wants us to love other people both as a way of reflecting his heart for them and also as a central way that we can actually demonstrate our love for him. The Bible Project had a really good podcast episode on the Sixth Commandment, and part of it was about just this idea that there are two key ways we can show our love for God. One way is by telling God that we love him through our worship. And in the Old Testament, worship was symbolized by offering gifts and sacrifices at the altar. That's what's in our last two verses from the passage for today. But the other key way of demonstrating our love for God It's by doing. We can show our love for God himself through loving others. And the point that this Bible Project podcast made was that while God wants us to demonstrate our love for him both ways, by telling him we love him through our worship and showing him we love him through our actions, that God will always prefer our actions over our words. God will always prefer that we live out our love for him by how we treat other people. Here's a verse from the Old Testament that teaches this same idea, that living in a way that demonstrates love for God and others, it's more important to God than bringing him a sacrifice or an offering to the altar. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God, rather than burnt offerings. Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life so we could have our sin be forgiven and be reconciled to God. And that's why we can now live in relationship with God and we can experience his love and his grace every day. So if the Holy Spirit brings to mind a specific instance of how we've spoken to someone in anger or with insults, insulting comments, we should go to that person and try to repair that relationship. We may or we may not be successful, but we're called to make the effort to seek reconciliation, especially with other followers of Jesus. Today's passage teaches us that it's critical to first deal with the brokenness in our own hearts that plays out in how we speak to other people before we run to God to tell him how much we love him. Because the God we love, he loves those other people too. And he wants us to demonstrate our love for him by loving them in the way that we talk to them as well as the way we act towards them. So let's close together in prayer. Um, Father God, 
I thank you for the commandments that you gave us to, to help us live the way we were created to. Um, and I ask that you please continue to give us the desire that we so desperately need that for your spirit to work in our hearts because we desperately need that. We need our hearts to be changed so that we can love you and so that we can love others um, in the way that you created us to. So I ask that your spirit continue to work in our hearts. Um, I ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Hello, everyone. We are going to get started with an from, oh, there we go, uh, from Diane. So come on up. There you go. Hi, y'all. <laughs> you know it's that time of the year again for Operation Christmas Child. <laughs> And for many of you may not know that it is a division of Samaritan's Purse. It's run by Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son. And it's where you take a box like this and there's a little label you put on it if you wanna pick a boy or a girl and what age level that you wanna use and put it in the box. And then uh, we also need to put $10 in the box. And what that does is that pays for the processing and shipping it all around the world, either by plane, boat, camel, donkey, or whatever the case may be. But uh, that is extremely helpful. And I tell people, you know, if you've never had the opportunity of praying with somebody to accept the Lord, this is really a great opportunity. Because through Operation Christmas Child, they say that if you average it out in a 24-hour period, Nearly 8,000, 8,000 children, friends, neighbors, whatever, accept the Lord through this ministry. And that's why I promote this ministry, because it is the number one child evangelistic ministry in the entire world. And for those of you that don't know, the boxes are always delivered to pastors, and the pastors are always prearranged. And also, there's a waiting list for pastors to get these boxes. And so, anyway... Um, every child that gets a gets a gospel message and then they get a little booklet in it in their own language and these are delivered to 170 countries and areas around the world uh, with the message in their own language which is really exciting so because of this uh, churches are planted and I learned the other day that in a given year a thousand new churches are planted because of the ministry of Operation Christmas Child. That is fantastic. Bible studies are started, churches grow. It's really amazing. Um, I, I told people on Sunday morning, I love some of the stories about people that get boxes. And there was a little boy that got a box. His father happened to be the number one witch doctor in the area and the little boy got the box and he went to the program and kept learning about it well his father wasn't too happy about that and wanted basically the pastor to leave town and if not you know i'm going to come and kill you but he kept listening to what the little boy was sharing and one day he came to the pastor and said i want to hear about your god because your god is more powerful than my god and literally he told other people other uh, witch doctors, and one day he brought over 300 people to come baptized. Amazing. So it not only changed a little boy's life, but it changed the whole area. So the important thing I want to tell you is pray for your box. Pray not just when you're doing your box, but pray around the year around because you never know the impact that that one box is going to have. For those of you that have little ones, Maybe you have uh, little neighbor kids, grandkids, or whatever. There's a little uh, flyer here that the kids can fill out, tell about themselves. And the thing that I like about this is um, it makes the box more personal. As many of you know, I mean, I'm a year-round volunteer, so I do over 100 boxes. And I write a personal note in each one because I have heard that that personal touch sometimes is the most valuable thing that a child receives in a box. So the more personal you can make it, the better. And then you're wondering, when do we bring back their boxes? Anytime, but please have them back before the middle of November. 
so then we can take them and have them processed. And I thank you very much. Yeah, the, the little list, the little list here, this thing here will give you ideas of what you put in the box. School supplies are really important because for some children, if they don't have school supplies, they can't go t to school. Uh, a toothbrush is really great, so you don't have to share a toothbrush with other people uh, or not have one at all. Uh, they talk about a wow gift. I went the other day to Five Below and I got soccer balls for only $5, where you go to like Target or whatever, you're gonna pay $15 for them. So anyway, there's places, and of course, you know, the 99 cent store or that type, you know, really helps you a lot. And then two, you know, people give you things. Um, I have, uh, you know, I have a little list here that anybody wants to pick up. And these are things you don't have to buy, but things that you may think you throw away. We make all sorts of toys. We make thousands of toys that you, know, you may throw away. So uh, I'll have a list out there. You can pick this up and talk to your neighbors. My, even my hairdresser brought me two bags of stuffed animals the other day to put in the box. So you never know who will help you. So get the word out, okay? And you can do it all year round, thanks. Thank you. Again, you can grab those boxes right out on the patio and just return them before middle of November. Thank you to Diane's group for the snack this morning. It was delicious. And coffee was Miss Wendy Turney. Uh, next week, we have Carrie's group on snack. And coffee is Teresa Karen's next week. That's it. We did it, you guys. <laughs> Have a great small group.